Good morning, Southwest Meat Association. My name is Rick Kimbrell, CEO of Start Clean Legacy, LLC. We provide contract cleaning services, detergents, and sanitizers to dozens of SMA members. I'd like to take a moment to thank our team, 400 strong here in the Southwest. For the last six months, they've been working harder than ever, just like the men and women in your plants. Without them, we wouldn't be able to serve the food industry. Our team, like yours, has continued to keep grocery store shelves full and stocked, and we're proud of that. StarClean's honored to be the sponsor of the 64th Annual SMA Convention. I'm so glad we were able to at least meet in, in this format. The last time I missed an SMA convention was in 1987, the Orlando Convention, when my father, Ray Kimbrell, he either couldn't or wouldn't fork over the money to take us to Florida. I'm thankful that my roots and our Start Clean family roots go back with SMA, about as long as this old classic's been on the road. This is the best job I've ever had. Every day we get to build the culture and have the opportunity to create the best job that you've ever had for so many people, helping build careers that coexist with a healthy work-life balance. To do this, we've created the Start Clean Wins Leadership Training Program. This program is mentoring and training all of our existing and future sanitation managers, coaching them to be prepared, consistent, confident, and to follow through as they help manage your food safety. If you see someone walking through your plant with one of these on, stop and encourage them. Again, StartClean commends all SMA members for their role in putting safe food on the table. The food industry will always be essential. We're proud to be a part of it. I know you are too. Work hard. We are very excited to have our next speaker, Dr. Mindy Brashears, the USDA's Undersecretary for Food Safety, overseeing the Food Safety Inspection Service. Prior to joining USDA, she was a professor of food safety and public health and the director of the International Center for Food Industry Excellence at Texas Tech University. She has spent her career improving food safety standards to make an impact on public health through research, outreach, and education. She is a fellow of the National Academy of Inventors and has received numerous awards, including the International Association for Food Protection L Laboratorian Award, the American Meat Science Association Distinguished Research Award, the American Meat Science Association Distinguished Industry Service Award, and the American Meat Science Achievement Award. She was listed in the National Provisioner's Top 25 Future Icons in the Meat Industry. We're very excited that she's able to be with us this morning. And Dr. Brashears, welcome, and it's all yours. Thank you. Let me get my screen up. All right, are we good now? Can you see the screen and everything in good shape? Yes. All right, good. Well, uh, thank you so much to uh, Joe Harris and to the Southwest Meat Association for having me today. I'm excited to visit with you. I definitely would be uh, happier to be there in person interacting with you. I think we get a lot out of that, but in this day and age, we have to have flexibility. So I'm honored to get to join you virtually today from my office in Washington, D.C. Speaking of D.C., uh, my path to Washington was long. Um, yesterday, I think there was an article in Food Safety News that it had counted the days 689 days from uh, my nomination to confirmation. I did work uh, for, for the department before that, but it took a long time, but it was well worth it. FSIS is a wonderful agency and I am very much enjoying my time here. As I've wrapped up the last year and, and I thought about everything I had experienced, I've 
started thinking about how I could bring my expertise into the agency and to influence it. And I really wanted to come up with priorities in order to, uh, to, to lead the agency with my areas of ex expertise. And I came up with uh, what I called our 2020 vision. And this vision had three overlapping and interrelated objectives. Those were leading with science, influencing behavior changes, and building relationships. Now this was all great and we had a lot of goals and objectives uh, lined out back in January. We had a kickoff meeting for uh, this 2020 vision and then we all know what happened. We were met with COVID-19, which was not on the radar and not a part of the vision but that's okay we uh we pivoted we made adjustments and i want to talk to you a little bit about what we did in response and what we continue to do for COVID 19 the pandemic uh and with our meat and poultry industry and then i will touch on some of the elements of the vision which get to really the nitty-gritty of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis at fsis so focus on the future all right, the next slide is our uh, food supply chain and COVID-19. One of the first things we had to do was um, make sure to reassure the public that COVID-19 is not uh, associated as a foodborne illness. This is a gastrointestinal illness. We have no evidence that COVID-19 uh, outbreaks or uh, illnesses have occurred uh, as a result of foodborne contact or as a result of uh, contacting contact with the packaging. And it's a very low risk even with services. The CDC has come out with that statement. We very much followed the CDC guidance and partner with the CDC on all of these decisions. But um, we want to continue to emphasize the statement. We also continue to emphasize the fact that what goes on in meat and poultry facilities now our regular sanitation programs and protocols, our, um, our, our protocols for uh, hand washing as well as cleaning equipment, all of those things really should be enough to kill COVID-19 in, uh, in a food processing environment. Now we face some very uh, specific challenges. Very early on, uh, we were getting questions on whether or not agriculture is an essential industry. And we know it is. We know that feeding the world is definitely an essential uh, task and operation, but there really wasn't a government declaration of, of agriculture being essential. So we worked with our partners across the government uh, through the secretary's office, with FDA as well, and uh, CISA released this letter, you've probably all seen it, saying that agriculture is essential. So that's one of the first steps that we took uh, during the, the pandemic when it first began. Another thing that happened is um, both Undersecretary Aba and I put out a public statement early on saying that we were committed to keeping um, inspectors and graders in the processing plants during the pandemic. We know that, um, especially with inspectors, that the plants can operate, cannot operate without inspection. And so we were committed to doing that. I'll get into some of the details of how we um, kept our inspectors in the plant and kept the food inspected uh, in, in subsequent slides. But I can say that we did not have any plant closures due to a lack of inspection. And I just wanna give a shout out to our inspectors for, uh, for working, for continuing to meet that need and that demand because um, some of them were uh, working overtime, multiple shifts, multiple days a week in order to do that. We then faced the challenge of labeling and we t made uh, some, some changes to, to allow some flexibility in labeling. Uh, we all know that there, there was a lot going on in the media saying there's a shortage of food, potential shortage of, of meat and poultry products. And um, reality is, you know, we did have some reduction in capacity and that did create some concerns. 
but we did have a lot of product in warehouses that should have that was destined for food service or for schools or for large institutions and operations these were bulk labels and uh, not labeled for retail but we made some um, allowances for product to be relabeled just fyi if anyone's wondering this is going to be extended we've been extending it 60 days at a time um, it is going to be extended again through september because it's about to expire again but um, what what happened is really our current labeling uh, required product to be brought back to a facility unpackaged repackaged relabeled uh, we allowed some direct labeling on the packages to give some flexibility to get this product into the grocery store so it could be moved and um, really we we uh, continue we plan to continue to expand this as long as needed I mentioned earlier that um, our, um, our inspectors uh, stayed on the line. Well, we were very concerned about the health and safety of our inspectors. Very first thing, as soon as this began, we allowed our inspectors to self-certify. And what this meant was that anyone that fell into a high-risk category, whether it be age or a pre-existing condition such as um, uh, high blood pressure, asthma, uh, some of those conditions that made them more susceptible or high risk for COVID-19, they could just simply declare that they were high risk and they were not required to work on the line. They were fully paid with benefits, some of these inspectors for over two months. This stayed in place until um, we worked with CDC to get face masks, face shields for them as mitigation strategies. We worked with CDC to come up with a decision tree on when they could come back to work. Um, most of our workforce is back, but we were reduced um, up to almost 900 employees at any given time, which was a big, um, you know, big shortage in our in, uh, number of inspectors, but we were still committed to getting, uh, meeting our inspection needs. We did this uh, at times from pulling people from uh, the district office, from pulling from APHIS and AMS, uh, individuals who had at one time worked for FSIS, they would come over, help us with our inspection needs. And again, we will stay committed to meeting these needs uh, now and in the future. And we will uh, able to be very creative. Uh, Paul Kicker in our Office of Field Operations worked very hard to meet these on a daily basis. Um, well, I've just mentioned that, that we continue to inspect. Uh, I've already covered that topic, so we'll move on to the next slide. Um, after we uh, were working on the, the meeting the inspection needs, uh, around in mid to late April, we had a CDC and OSHA guidance that were uh, released. These documents were released. We um, worked with them to get this information out. And, uh, but as you know, FSIS oversees food safety, uh, not employee safety. And we've been very careful about um, allowing each branch of government to oversee each individual area. Now they've been respectful and worked with us as a one government approach, but um, making sure that what we do and what they do uh, will work. But we had our guidance documents that came out to mitigate risk in uh, facilities. Most of you are probably well aware of some of these things. These include items such as putting up shields in between workstations, wearing the face masks, wearing face shields, sometimes in the slaughter floor when you can't have the barriers in place, screening employees as they come in, along with a, a lot of other factors. Um, and so we've, we've really encouraged our industry to implement these for your own worker safety, as well as the safety of um, our inspectors. We did have a number of inspectors that uh, did get sick or exposed. And again, this took some of our work workforce out from time to time uh, in the highest levels of the pandemic. The good news is, is that, um, you know, since we've seen uh, these mitigation strategies in place, this is anecdotal, I'm not quoting any data, but we have seen that uh, there has been a great reduction in the spread of illnesses among our, work, uh, our workers and our workforce. So very soon, just a couple of days after um, the CDC guidance came out, we had an executive order that was put, put forth 
by the president. And the pre uh, this delegated the uh, to Secretary Purdue the ability to keep our food supply chain operational. Initially, it applied to meat and poultry facilities. We ultimately signed a MOU with FDA, so it would really cover uh, the entire food, food chain. So we would be able to have food provided to our country. It was at this point that we really realized, and, and we've taken this point for granted, I think, in the US, we realized that Having a safe and abundant food supply is a matter of national security. And this protected that and protected our ability to provide food to our uh, consumers and to keep food on the table. Now, we never had to utilize the executive order, but it did allow us to, to uh, talk with the CDC, with state and local health departments to help them reopen. This slide kind of illustrates what we did uh, at USDA. If you, if you look at USDA in the middle, we really uh, played a role in coordinating uh, um, with our uh, state health departments with making sure that we were meeting the, the, the guidelines. Sometimes this was a local health department. This sometimes expanded to the governor's office where I spoke many times to governors across the nation, to the uh, state commissioner of agriculture across the nation, trying to get this going. We were concerned about the safety of the workers. We did want the food supply chain to stay open and that was very important as well. But first and foremost, we wanted to meet those safety considerations. We were able to do that, which led to reopening. We did have a period of time and it was really about 10 days to two weeks. It seems much longer than that when our, uh, we had really uh, significant decline in operations. We still follow this. Um, this is um, a snapshot of a um, dashboard we created at USDA, and we compare our uh, production to what we're producing this year on this day to what we produced last year on this day. You can see uh, as of April 28th, our cattle slaughter capacity was down 38%, and our swine slaughter capacity was down 40%. This was a very difficult time, a very difficult um, day and a span of days for us when our capacity was so low. We slowly watched the industry recover. The good news and what I, I mean, I keep saying that in hindsight, we're gonna look back on the meat and poultry industry at the way they responded and how quickly they responded because um, this was as of July 14th, we're basically back to um, a capacity compared to last year, but really it was within a couple of weeks, we were up to 90% compared to last year's production. Our industry is resilient. They recovered, they responded. Um, we saw um, the response across the board and I am so honored to be able to see it really from my perspective, because the changes that were made, the controls that were put in place to protect the employees, and in order to make sure that food was on the table was just, it was an amazing sight to see that. And there were so many pieces involved and, and everyone was had the same dedication. We worked with companies across the nation, but everyone had the same goal in mind to get food out the door, but also to protect our workers, our inspectors and everyone in the plant. And it was, it, it was really, it was great. And, uh, you know, I look forward to telling the story uh, even more in the days to come. So um, one other thing I'll touch on is um, that really became an issue and really became a focus during the pandemic was um, the issue with custom exempt plants, the need for small and very small uh, processors to step in, fill the gap, uh, when some of our large, larger operations uh, were reduced capacity or even closed. And uh, with that, I think with, with everything that, um, that you experience, you look at an opportunity to be able to make improvements. So uh, we really want to provide uh, support for our small and very small processors. 
We feel like um, we already have um, a lot of guidance documents. We have small plant roundtables. We were supposed to have uh, a listening session yesterday with small and very small processors. We look forward to having that hopefully in person in um, the weeks or months to come because it's very important for us to get input so we can meet the needs of the sm uh, small and very small establishments. We um, are working on the different uh, needs as well with state inspection. State inspection is um, a little bit complex. Um, oh, and I want to go back to uh, the slide. I don't have to physically go back, but I want to say that we are hosting a webinar next week. Um, it's on a, a Tuesday afternoon, and Joe Harris is going to um, send the information because you must register for this. But this webinar uh, will be hosted by uh, me and also Betty Brandt, who is the under, uh, Deputy Undersecretary for Rural Development. We will be talking about how to, um, how small and very small processors can go through the process to get federally inspected, get a grant of inspection. Betty will be talking about uh, funding opportunities that are available through rural development for our small and very small establishments. So um, be ready for that, and Joe will be sharing that link with you at some point. Now, um, moving over to state inspection, we have both federal inspection, which um, uh, is FSIS, but then we are very supportive of our state uh, inspection programs. We have two state inspection programs. We have the state meat and poultry inspection, which is the MPI program. We have 27 states that participate in this. And these uh, programs are what we call at least equivalent to federal standards, which means the food is as safe as they were whenever it was produced under federal, in, um, federal inspection. FSIS reimburses the cost of that up to 50%. And we also provide training and other resources for this program. We also have the CIS program for um, seven states. The CIS program is um, a program that is the same as, now at least equal to or equivalent to and same as, sound, sounds like the same thing, but it's not. It could differ in things like um, the inspection task, uh, the labeling and different things. You must be in a CIS program in the state in order to ship across state lines. And this is not only within a state, an individual establishment also has to be approved to be in the CIS program. FSIS reimburses up to 60% of the cost of this particular program. Now, um, we often, we've been getting the question, how come a state uh, product can't cross the state line? Um, this is a, a couple of big reasons, there's multiple reasons, but the two big reasons is, number one, is that um, we lose the ability to track the, pro the product and if there was an outbreak or a recall, we would not be able to have traceability to trace it back and to understand the origin of that outbreak. And the other reason is a trade issue. Um, uh, establishment being uh, equivalent or at least equal to does not meet our requirement of our federal program for equivalency with other countries. We want to maintain that so we're still able to uh, ship internationally so we don't want to put a threat to that. Uh, but that's why we have the CIS program in addition to the, um, the, the state program so companies can participate in that. So um, that really kind of covers most of our issues we address during uh, the time of COVID. Uh, my light has gone out, so I'm going to move around so my light will come back on. Sorry about that. <laughs> Part of the virtual fun here. And I want to cover uh, some of the programs that we have in place and have going on at uh, FSIS. Like I said, leading with science, influencing behavior change, and building relationships. I'll just touch on these as our 2020 vision. One of the big things that we're concerned about is targeting salmonella. And uh, salmonella uh, is, has been something that we've addressed uh, for quite some time at the agency, and I have spent quite a lot of time understanding the, the, 
the policies and, and different programs we have to address salmonella at FSIS. Uh, we have research priorities related to salmonella. We have developed a fellowship program. If anyone here is a graduate student or if you're a faculty member from a university, our fellowship program right now is open. We are looking for students to work on FSIS priority areas. Uh, it's a, it, it's a quite a large fellowship, so look into that. The applications are due pretty quickly, but we can send you that information. We're also looking at lymph node testing, uh, uh, interagency program called GenFS across FDA, the NIH, uh, CDC, where we're trying to identify pathogenicity uh, genes within salmonella so we can target those that are the most pathogenic. We are also committed to removing barriers that may prevent uh, companies from implementing technologies. So we really want uh, companies to be able to operate and test uh, validated technologies in their facilities without being concerned of uh, getting out of uh, compliance with the performance standard or something like that. So we are considering proposals from companies for that. We are also revisiting the use of low dose ionizing radiation uh, as an intervention uh, without labeling as a processing aid and we're working with FDA on that and this uh, some information on that will be available for uh, public comment in the not too distant future. Some of our uh, existing policies that are in place, uh, modernized inspection. We have moved forward uh, with modernized poultry inspection. It's been in place for a few years. We have also, uh, in the last few months, announced the, the new swine inspection. We really encourage the new inspection. It's focused on food safety tasks. And we are considering waivers for modernized beef inspection. We would like to see those waivers come in so we can start collecting data on beef inspection and moving ahead um, with a rule on modernized beef inspection in the future. As I already mentioned, we have performance standards in place. We have those in place for poultry, but we have proposed beef performance standards for salmonella. We will have pork performance standards proposed and out for public comment before the end of the year. Uh, guidance documents are out there for controlling salmonella um, in poultry products as well, well as in other products. I encourage you to look at those. We have petitions in place. I'm going to talk about one of those um, just here in a moment. And then we also are engaged with international equivalency uh, programs. We currently have a petition in place where um, they have asked us to consider salmonella as an adulterant in meat and poultry or, uh, well, in any product that FSIS regulates. Uh, we considered a similar petition a few years ago on antibiotic resistant salmonella. We rejected that petition. Now, I put this piece of data up here because I want to show you that over the years, uh, this is in poultry, um, in the past year, as we are over the past several years, as we have implemented a performance standards, we have seen the amount of salmonella in poultry products to be reduced. We monitor this. We monitor salmonella in all of our uh, major commodities, beef, pork, and poultry, and uh, we really feel that performance standards are driving the numbers down. For uh, the salmonella petition, we um, the last one was rejected because of several uh, components as far as um, the dose of the salmonella, the, the impact of illnesses, and several other items. That we have not been presented with any new data. We will consider this petition, but we do uh, plan to um, react to this uh, fairly quickly, hopefully by the end of the year. So um, this just reiterates what I just said. The product may be considered an adulterant if it's implicated uh, in an outbreak. And so this is our stance with salmonella now. We, if we have a uh, salmonella outbreak, and we have uh, confirmed evidence where the outbreak strain is linked back to a meat or poultry product, we have uh, asked for that product to be recalled, thus considering it an adulterated product 
if it's considered uh, in an outbreak. At this time, um, that's really our stance at FSIS. Now, agency-wide, we have several sal salmonella initiatives underway, and I have asked our scientists to put together a salmonella roadmap. We will be moving forward with a public meeting on salmonella on September 22nd. This will be announced in the Federal Register, and you will need to register for that. But we will be discussing the initiatives within FSIS, but we will also be uh, gathering information from our stakeholders to understand the needs and how we move forward in the future in order to control salmonella. And just kind of as a side note is we will also have a public meeting on consumer education which touches on salmonella as well. That will probably be in October. So be looking for those announcements. The second area that I'll touch on briefly is building relationships. I believe the core of any successful organization is uh, developing strong relationships. It's very important for us to have strong relationships with Congress. They provide us with funding. They're always sending us letters and asking questions, and we are more than happy to uh, answer those. Uh, Paul Kicker and I had a uh, roundtable with the Senate Ag Committee a few weeks ago and went very well. I was able to um, express, Paul and I were both able to express to them how our industry adapted and, and responded to COVID-19. Both uh, sides of the aisle were very happy, very thankful, and, and it was a very positive experience for us to get to tell the story to Congress. We also have strong relationships with our international partners, university, and our federal partners, which I've already touched on. Stakeholders, um, this is a great example of interacting with stakeholders uh, today doing this talk. I'm happy to visit with you. Uh, we have roundtables. We um, take every opportunity we can to interact with our industry stakeholders as well as our consumer stakeholders uh, and listen to their concerns and try to meet those within the agency. I um, already mentioned that. Um, here, oh, here is a detailed uh, link on our uh, rural development collaboration webinar that will be next week. It will be next uh, Tuesday. Uh, again, this link will be sent out to you uh, by Joe Harris. So last of all, the last topic I want to touch on is influencing behavior changes. So um, there's a lot of things we talk about. There's a lot of things that we know in our mind to be the right thing to do. But uh, as far as doing it, that's a different thing. I always tell people it was easy to teach a student when I was in academia. It's easy to teach them what the proper cooking temperature of a ground beef patty needs to be in order to make sure it's safe. It's a different thing for them to go home and use a food thermometer to see if they met that. And that's really our goal in influencing behavior changes. We, we are developing a strong relationship with our employees. Uh, Paul uh, Kicker and I have been out to, I think, 13 different uh, establishments since, since uh, the COVID-19 pandemic began just to engage with our employees to make sure uh, they're doing okay, to see what their needs are, and also to see how the industry is doing as well. We are also concerned with consumers. I also, I always like to end with our consumer uh, efforts as far as engaging with stakeholders. Consumers are the end users. We all know that uh, and, and I think it's very important and it's even more important, some of the research we have done shows uh, some very interesting things. We fa have found in our studies that we are doing in, in um, conjunction with uh, North Carolina State University that only about 1% of individuals are properly washing their hands. This is uh, from three years of data collection. So uh, this is, uh, has been something that you think, you know, hand washing, this is a basic uh, a, a food public health uh, action you should do to prevent any illness, but they're not doing it. With the past, the events of the past few months, there's been a huge emphasis on hand washing. We're about to start phase four and it will be uh, interesting to see if that uh, changes in our consumers. We hope we'll see an impact of the, the national effort with a focus on hand washing. So with that, um, I will wrap up. 
Uh, at FSIS, we say uh, we add to the secretary's motto of do right and feed everyone. And we add one word to that and say do right and feed everyone safely. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Yes. Yes, we do have a couple of questions coming in. Uh, Great. The first one is, when will the agency have an update on the beef salmonella guidelines? On the beef salmonella, um, I don't have an answer to that. I know we are working on all of our salmonella guidance guidelines. Uh, we're really working diligently to get those out as soon as possible. We did get um, delayed a little bit because of COVID-19, uh, but, but I'll see if I can get an answer for you on that and get back to you on it. Next question, when will modernization of a processing inspection be addressed? Um, well, we already have uh, modernization in our poultry and swan facilities. At this time, we are encouraging beef facilities to submit uh, waivers to us. We're considering those waivers and we are very supportive of those waivers for beef modernization. So we can move ahead with that. The more waivers we get, the more data we can collect and uh, then we could move forward with a final rule once we have enough data to inform um, a, a change in modernization for beef. So we're happy to address, we're happy to consider it right now, and we actually are encouraging our industry partners to to get those submitted. Next question: How is the agency working with the Salmonella Blue Ribbon Task Force? Oh, we have. Uh, they have been very. Uh, uh, very good in keeping us up to date and what they're doing. We're as uh, supportive of their efforts. We are supportive of efforts to uh, to control salmonella in any way. I think they're taking a very positive approach in that they are uh, putting together the industry, identifying the gaps uh, and, and what needs to be done and engaging FSIS uh, so we can help in any way that we can. So we're very supportive and anything we can do to engage with that group. Uh, we're very open to that and we're excited for this opportunity and to see where it goes. And can you clarify as to when salmonella will be considered an adultery? Uh, well, we are, uh, we have a petition before us right now um, from uh, from a multiple different entities and they have asked us to consider salmonella as an adulterant. We rejected a similar petition um, a few years ago. We don't see any new data presented to us. And um, we, we do have to respond to this petition. At this time, we, we only see salmonella as an adulterant. If we have an outbreak and we have traced it back specifically to a product and have a match back uh, both from a, a, a the outbreak and have the outbreak strain and it's traced back to the product. So at this time, salmonella is not considered an adulterant uh, on a regular basis in any of our product. Next question. Do you have an update on export submissions becoming electronic? <laughs> yeah, um, I don't have a, a final update. I can tell you we are moving in that direction as quickly as possible. This is um, a very complex uh, uh, undertaking as uh, the cooperation not only has to happen on our end as well as uh, with our uh, cooperating, cooperating countries and partners and then uh, as well as the IT situation. You know, ultimately we would like to get to uh, electronic uh, export uh, certification. We're moving in that direction. We don't have an absolute timeline at this time. Next question. Do you have an answer for overtime issues due to COVID-19? Um, any overtime as, okay, I, is this, well, you may not be able to clarify. Uh, we do have uh, our lots of our inspectors are working overtime. So on our end, we have several inspectors that are willing to work overtime. They have been over working overtime to meet that need. 
On uh, the flip side, we have um, seen many industries working overtime uh, and, and putting in overtime in order to uh, meet the demand. I do want to address, take this opportunity to let you know that we're very um, supportive of, there's been some uh, legislation uh, proposed to alleviate some of the overtime challenges that are faced by the small and very small processor uh, that is um, being considered. So um, anyone, you know, who who's interested in that, I, I really encourage you to support that. I think that that would be a big help to our small and very small plants to alleviate the overtime um, challenges that are seen by our smaller industries. Do you have an update on Appendix B? Um, well, currently we, both Appendix A and Appendix B, as you know, have been updated. Uh, the new ones, uh, at this time, you can still operate under the, the old Appendix A and Appendix B because we have identified uh, many research gaps, uh, especially with Appendix B on some of our, um, uh, well, on especially on Appendix A, actually, but we are trying to work with ARS as well as with our NIFA uh, partners to put out calls for proposals and our industry funding groups to get those research gaps filled. Uh, we know that we need data to inform that. So currently, you can operate under the the, the original or the older uh, Appendix A and Appendix B as we move forward to meet those research gap needs. And we have a two-part question for camp regarding Campylobacter. When can we expect to see the updated Campylobacter standard for poultry? And what is the timeline for Campylobacter testing requirements for poultry? Right. Um, we have two sets of campy performance standards. Um, one is for, uh, and for poultry, we have um, whole carcasses on turkey, and then we have whole carcasses in parts for uh, chicken, and then we have comminuted. The comminuted uh, standard came out, and, it, and we've had public comment, and we are discussing that. We expect that to be out uh, within um, the next a few months, uh, probably by the end of the year. And then once that is released, there will be, you know, a timeline for implementation and uh, for, uh, for our different uh, establishments to be able to, to, to understand that timeline and when it will be implemented. I do want to encourage you to go ahead and, you know, we are collecting this CAMPI data now on a weekly basis. Be aware of what your CAMPI data is, what it looks like, um, uh, where you may need to make changes. And so, you know, always be aware of it. Even though we don't have the performance standard in place yet, that doesn't mean uh, you shouldn't be watching it and controlling it if you have a seasonal issue or if you have, uh, you know, a certain flock that may come in with issues. So, so always look at that data and utilize the data we collect in a way to make your pro uh, product and processes safer. And we have one last question. There have been several public notices issued versus a recall due to incorrect labeling and not including allergens. How did the agency come to this conclusion as in the past a recall has always been issued? Uh, could you read that again? Yeah. There have been several public notices issued versus a recall due to incorrect labeling and not including allergens. How did the agency come to this conclusion as in the past a recall has always been issued? Uh, well, generally, FSIS can put out the public notice. Um, as you all know, the recalls are initiated by the establishments themselves. And so um, the recalls, and, and obviously we encourage that recall to, to occur. If it doesn't, we can put out a public notice on that. That doesn't mean that necessarily that someone hasn't uh, initiated the recall, but we move forward um, often with public notices if we see something going on, but we can't identify the source. And this happens with pathogens such as um, E. coli or salmonella will put out a public notice when we haven't identified the source, but we know that it has been associated with beef or ground beef or poultry, just so people are more aware of it. So that's generally um, how we initiate a public notice. 
Okay, we see, we, we've had one more come in as we get close to the close to, to wrapping this with this thing up. Uh, one of the attendees is interested in uh, when the agency will conduct a roundtable on foreign material. Um, we have had a couple of roundtables on foreign material in DC, and I think late last year. Um, if we have a need for that, I think you know we're more than willing to listen to that. We we had some actually a round of roundtables to address you know how how the industry is addressing it, what the needs are to clarify our guidance documents. So if there are some specific questions, um, I encourage you to reach out through Ask FSIS, and then also um, go and look at uh, the transcripts of some of the things we put out because we've had some roundtables. And then we also have our small and very small plant roundtables round that we will continue. And you can always bring those topics up or specific questions up about uh, form materials in those roundtables. Okay, and your answer to the uh, CAMPI standard question uh, the the attendee asked for a little more clarification just to be so that they're clear you expect the common unit standard by the end of the year and then when for carcasses and parts we do not have a timeline on that at the time at this time well with that we're, we're at the end of our allotted time and I want to sincerely thank you for getting on here this morning and doing a, doing a great job of covering up a lot of areas uh, Thanks. We, we look forward to the in-person listening session. Uh, I know I did, we did get a note from at least one member who said, said that they have at least three pages worth of questions. So uh, oh, that's we, great. We, we, we probably wouldn't get to all those today. So, Well, you know, I love answering questions, so it's a lot of fun. I'm glad we had so many questions today. I think people are uh, braver in the virtual environment, so that's one positive, you know. Well, so. there were a lot of them submitted anonymously. That's fine. You know, that's fine. That's great. That's what we're here for to serve the public. So it's good. Well, thank you very much. Well, thank you for the invitation. I hope the rest of the conference goes great. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Our world is growing. As population growth continues to rise and wealth increases, so does the demand for food, feed, and fuel. Traditional resources are depleting, and the demand for sustainable ingredients is growing. That's where we come in. We are committed to help meet that demand as we believe that nature has significantly more to offer than we currently use. We believe that we can maximize the use of natural resources by continuously improving ourselves, our processes, and our products. Giving nature a second life is our second nature. With our roots dating back to the late 19th century, we have evolved from a small rendering company into the world's leading innovative developer and producer of sustainable organic ingredients for a growing population. Our unique broad product and service portfolio is active all over the world, customized for high-end markets and local needs. Each day, our dedicated employees live what we all believe. We serve society by maximizing nature's value so that people stay healthy, homes stay warm, children stay happy, dogs and trucks keep running, and farmers can flourish, not just today, but infinitely. We are Darling Ingredients.